Today, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Today, we'd like to talk about sports betting, especially market dynamic and the relationship between betting operators and sports organizations. Let's take a look at our agenda. First, brief project introduction. Second, answer our findings based on our two objectives, general relationship and case study of a target sports. We'll talk about more of the target sports. And conclusion, we try to make it simple. Our project has been recast by a sports worker, so client contact person was Sara, and AISTS Amandine was our supervisor. It's been successfully studied by our team. Our team leader, Jalika from Italy, um, Ali from Turkey, and Dufu from India, and myself, South Korea. Then why? Why this project needs to be studied? Over the past 10 years, the integrity of sports has been threatened by match fixing, illegal betting, and other pros. So FIFA and IOC started to monitor the games. And following this, sports occurred, uh, tried to protect the sports integrity. And also, in terms of the economy, um, sports betting is a huge market <coughs> now. 41% out of the whole global online betting market is a sports betting. And also, according to ICSS this year report, um, global sports betting is approximately 200 to 500 billion euros. This is tremendous market. So from this kind of background, we aimed at a couple of things. Our first objective was identifying the relationship between sports organization and betting operators. And our second objective was finding the major global betting trends in eight target sports. Why? <coughs> uh, eight sports is badminton, basketball, fencing, handball, hockey, ice hockey, table tennis, and volleyball. Why do you say sports? Because sports like football or cricket, there is much information we have already. But in this age first, there's, there's lack of information about sports betting. So sports worker uh, pointed them, targeted them, and has given to us with this project. Let me briefly introduce the scope and methodology. For the scope, we focused on online betting market and international sports federation. And we looked into 20 major international betting operators in terms of activities, the variety of betting offer. And of course, uh, eight sports. For the methodology, basically we did um, with analysis from data correction, books, report, regulations, and other references. And we took uh, observation 20 major international betting operators website to identify the betting type and other trends. And we made also a scan of around 500 international, national sports federation and leagues website, which are related to A sports. <coughs> also, attending convention was another master. So actually, we went to parties to attend ICSS, International Center for Sports Security, the convention, in this year in May. And lastly, we made a contact 25 professionals, experts in betting industry. Now, Jaluka will talk about our first finding. Thank you, Phil. So, as Phil mentioned, <coughs> the first important objective of our project was to identify all the different types of relationships existing between the world of betting operators and sports organizations. To this purpose, we created and conceptualized a proper relationship typology. And we firstly decided to categorize all the relationships found into two big categories, which are, are the financial relationships and non-financial relationships. The first category includes all the profit-oriented relationships and the ones in which the economic dimension is the generally prevailing one, while the second category includes all the relationships based on a commonality or a convergence of interest, which in most of the cases is related to the sphere of the protection of the integrity of sports. Now I'll briefly go over, uh, offer you an overview of all the relationships, starting from the financial. 
side. So we have sponsorship, partnership deals, advertising, <coughs> acquisition of audiovisual rights, and these are the relationships, the financial relationships in which the commercial dimension is manifestly predominant. And then we have the compulsory financial contributions arising from specific laws and the exploitation of sports event organizer rights. And these are the relationship in which arising from legal obligations. Then going to the non-financial side, we have memorandum of understanding, monitoring of betting, educational programs, and exchange of information and evidence. Now I'll try to go a bit deeper into each one of them, starting from the financial side. So sponsorship and partnership deals were by far the most frequent types of relationships emerged with hundreds of deals uh, observed across the eight sports analyzed. So there is a clear will from betting operators to use strategic sponsorship to reach out their target demographics. Indeed, <coughs> since the people most likely to bet on sports are sports fans, Sponsorship of a sport property is an obvious way for betting operators to attract new users. And the same goes for advertising, by which betting operators associate their brands to sports by using images and video related to sports events. Now, betting operators are exploring these territories also because recent studies from KPMG and TaylorBet illustrate that recreational users do not seem to be tapped by the current betting advertisement. Then we have the acquisition of audiovisual rights, and these relationships is related to a new, uh, a new with, let's say, to the, develop the development of live betting. Indeed, betting operators tend to acquire broadcasting rights in order to provide their customers with live streaming during throughout their betting activities. Now, going to the financial relationship from a legal perspective, we have the compulsory financial contribution which is becoming a diffuse way for governments and public authorities to subsidize sports both at the national and international level. For instance, in Europe, uh, almost one-tenth of all the revenues generated by lotteries are allocated back to sport. In 2013, almost two billion. And of course, for the scope of our project, it should be underlined that in Europe, almost all lottery providers also offer betting in their services. And then we have the exploitation of the sports events organizer rights, and this is a peculiar form which arise from a, a new model introduced in France with a law passed in 2010. And it is a very innovative and interesting model. So basically, betting operators now have to negotiate and obtain consent from the rights owner of a sport event in order to offer their bets on those competitions. So precisely, the events organizer holds an exploitation right, which is a monopoly, and this monopoly also uh, applies to the exploitation of the event in the form <coughs> of that. So this is a very interesting model. Now, moving to the non-financial relationships. The first type is the memorandum of understanding, which typically is uh, bilateral, multilateral agreements between two or more parties, and it is mostly used to protect the integrity of sport and to fight match fixing. And there are many, many agreements between sports federations and betting operators on this. Then we have the cooperation agreements on monitoring of betting. Uh, in this field, a considerable progress has been made thanks to the development of advanced warning systems by betting operators in order to alert sports organizations of any suspicious or unusual betting activity. Then we observed many educational pro programs and we found that some betting <coughs> operators are supporting or adhering to these educational initiatives. Uh, a best practice in this area comes from the European Gaming and Betting Association, which financed and implemented uh, an awareness raising program aimed at uh, educating athletes about uh, betting risk and match fixing. And lastly, we have the exchange of information and evidence which is typically used to prevent possible instances of manipulation, but most importantly to exchange evidentiary material between sports organizations and betting operators in order to facilitate disciplinary investigations. Now I'll leave the floor to Nupur, which who will introduce you to our case studies. Thanks, Giorgio. 
So we established so far that bedding is a huge market and there are various types of relationships that exist between the bedding world and the sports organizations at large. What I'm going to speak about is what is in it for each of our eight targeted sports? How are they reacting to this bedding phenomenon? So for this purpose, we first analyzed or monitored the websites of all leading online bedding operators, about 20 to 25 of those. And the very first thing that we noticed is that there's wide variation between all these eight targeted sports. Not all the betting operators provide betting opportunities for these sports. It's only the sports of basketball and volleyball which have maximum coverage. <coughs> and this difference gets further elaborated if we look at it in terms of volume of money bet. In this regard, basketball has a clear lead over all the other seven targeted sports. <coughs> then, to go deeper into how this industry works, let me talk to you about the five major classes of betting types offered. The first is the 1x2, which is a simple three result phenomenon. For example, the two teams playing team A and team B, then there are only three results. Either the team A wins, or the team B wins, or there's a draw. But to make things more interesting is this handicap. Let's say I'm playing a match of basketball with Professor Boris, and given his height, he has a clear advantage. And it won't be a balanced match if we do this simple 1x2 with him. So for a head start, he get, I will get a head start in terms of betting to make things a little more balanced. Next, we have the derived bet exact. These are the bets which have a clear relationship to the uh, final outcome of the game. For example, the halftime win winners, the total number of, uh, the total margin of victory. Next, we have the derived bet over and under, which relates to a particular statistic of the game. Let's say for a match of hockey, the bet is total number of goals will be more than five. And if I score three and Professor Boris scores one, there are only four and we lose overall because the total number is four. Now the next one, proportional, which is my personal favorite, is the most creative type of bet. Here you can see any type of uh, betting rate ranging from the total number of yellow cards that will be there or the color of the socks that I'll wear for my game. And uh, given this definition, it's quite natural to see that <coughs> the maximum variation of sub-betting types within these are noticed for the pro proposition type of bets. Now, as Phil pointed out, the major betting risks are for the bigger games like football, golf, or cricket. But for the eight targeted sports, the risk is not so huge right now. But the case might not be so in the future. So the question is, are the federations prepared for it in terms of the regulations that they have in place? The answer is yes and no. At a basic level, all the regulations have all the federations have regulations in place to prevent the athletes or the officials to participate in betting. But if we go a level down and see that the, whether the federations have the regulations to prevent the athletes from promoting their friends or relatives to participate or to share insider information with them, well, not all the federations have such regulations in place. Also, not all of them have clear penalties laid out as to what happens to the athlete if they are found guilty. And there are also certain good best practices that can be observed, for example, the Badminton Federation has a very unique whistleblower system in which anyone can anonymously report if any kind of suspicious betting activity is observed. So it gives the betting federation a good monitoring system as to what's going on in the betting. Now on a brighter side, the betting world, uh, the sports organizations are also using this phenomenon to their advantage. There are dozens and dozens of sponsorship agreements that can be observed with, from the federations to the betting operators. And this is the case across the eight targeted sports. Now I'll let Jianluka conclude as summary. Thank you, Nupur. So now I would like to sum up and illustrate our conclusions. So here we have the key takeaways that we would like you to live with <coughs> today. So first of all, the sports betting segment currently stands at the phenomenal, mar phenomenal market value and its expansion is expected to continue growing over a global scale. Also thanks to the increasing liberalizations of the betting markets around the world and thanks to the develop development of 
like betting and mobile gambling. Then multiple financial and non-financial types of relationships exist between <coughs> betting operators and sports organizations, but sponsorship is the only well-leveraged one. From our case studies, basketball and volleyball seems to be the most popular sports among betting operators within the eight sports studies studied. And lastly, federations have only basic level of regulations in place to keep betting in check. Now, given the enormous volume of turnover generated by the betting industry, it is crucial for all the sports stakeholders and all the stakeholders involved in sports organizations to develop a close cooperation with operators in order to leverage the economic opportunities related to these activities, but at the same time mitigate the risk, the intrinsic risk uh, related to these practices. So for these reasons, assuming the perspective of sports federations, we would like to briefly sum up some of the opportunities and risks that we found in our, identify in our project. So from the opportunity side, the potential economic return is huge. So this can certainly create new revenue streams for sports organizations. And for this reason, the relationship typology that we created in our report can be used as a guiding point for sports federations to establish profitable association with betting operators. Then it should be taken into consideration the fact that new betting laws are currently being studied and possibly the French model will be replicated in other states soon, and this is a very interesting case. And lastly, because of its success, betting should be also seen as a medium to engage new funds. Now, going to the risk side, as we mentioned, regulations of federations are not stringent enough to mitigate betting risk, and therefore there is a clear need for harmonized <coughs> model rules on this. Similarly, specific guidelines addressing the potential conflict of interest within governance of sports organizations are required. And the best practice in this area comes from European lotteries, which in 2013 established a code of conduct for their members uh, in order to prevent their members to have any possible conflict of interest with sports organizations. <coughs> then, Sports organizations should also take into account the reputational damages and collateral effects which may derive from an association with betting operators. Namely, the negative image, gambling addiction, but also impact on young people, for example. And, it, and to conclude, it is not the case that some federations have already banned betting sponsorship and advertisement for their competitions. Thank you.